Welcome to this latest installment of FHN's community video. I hope you have been enjoying the content and the information that we've been sharing. And today I'm very pleased to be able to welcome Dr. Robert Geller. Dr. Geller is our infectious disease physician who you've heard from before in previous videos, but in this video he's going to talk a lot more about vaccines and vaccinations. So I'm really pleased to be able to have somebody with his level and depth of knowledge to share with all of you. Thank you again, Dr. Geller. A vaccine is a medication that is used to prevent an illness. What happens when the body is exposed to, let's say, a virus, like influenza, the body then manufactures protective things called antibodies, so in the future you are immune. Well, a vaccine is a make-believe infection where we introduce either the live virus or a piece of the virus into your body to make believe you're infected. Your body then produces protection, and then when you develop immunity to, to this vaccine, you also develop immunity to the, real vac to the real virus when it comes in contact with you. Well, the ones that people have heard of, such as smallpox and polio and measles, are not only well-known viruses, but they're one of the few viruses that will give you lifelong immunity. And of course, the influenza virus, everybody's heard of that one, which we, we should get every year. And the reason why we get it every year is because polio is polio, measles is measles, the viruses don't change, whereas the influenza virus each year is different. So they name viruses like someone's called John Smith or Mary Jones, and, and influenza viruses will have names based on part of their bodies in letters. So if someone has a vaccine to what's called an H1N1 influenza vaccine, they're immune to that one. But if the following year, a different number, H3N5, comes along. If you haven't gotten that vaccine, you will then get, you, you will then get that. So some, vac some vaccines work for the illness period. Others have to be given repeatedly because the virus changes. Yes, a, the word is shot, just like if you get an injection of penicillin in your arm or your rear, it's called a shot. And when people go to the doctor, they, they see a needle, so it's a shot. But, so the term penicillin shots or influenza shot, we know what that means. But a vaccine, a vaccine, the influenza vaccine is like I told you, it's an injection which will put in the particles of the virus that will induce in your body immunity at least to a reasonable extent to that virus. Well, like I say, uh, there aren't that many that are lifelong, uh, the measles and the polio and smallpox are lifelong, and some viruses will last for a while. Some viruses we think will last longer if you get a booster and the new shingles vaccine uh, that came out uh, last year, they recommend what's called a booster in a, in, a few, in a few months afterwards, and that boosts, we think, will give you protection for a number of years. And if you look up a, a, a virus on the CDC, some are five years, some are 10 years, those kinds of things. So it varies with the, with the, with the illness. Yes. Vaccines, vaccines are for the most part safe. I mean, anything, anything, even distilled water, if you inject somebody, they might have a reaction to that particular thing. But uh, by reaction, I mean a sore arm. Um, and 
So some people will say they, they get a sore arm. Most people will say no. Some people say, oh, it may be tired for a few days. Uh, and that's it. But they're definitely safe as opposed to an injection of penicillin in somebody who's known to be allergic. So that you don't want to do. But people are not usually known to be allergic to vaccines. We assume as children there are a series of childhood vaccines that, that, that we all know about, uh, measles, mumps, and those kinds of things. And um, that's something that everybody should have by the time they're grown up. And as a grown up, I recommend you know, this, the shingles vaccine, like I said, after a certain age. And I think that everybody should get influenza vaccine. And the reason I say that is because most cases of flu, you can say, you know, I was sick for uh, five days, seven days, six days, I had a fever, I felt miserable, I had a cough, and then I was fine. Why do you need a vaccine? Because you can't predict and your age or your gender or your state of health does not necessarily predict who will have a bad reaction. And like when we had this famous H1N1 outbreak in 2009, what was horrifying people was that children and pregnant women were dying, not the kind of person you expect to die. So if you can't be 100% sure that getting the natural infection won't be very serious, won't give you pneumonia, won't cause you to be in the ICU, then it's a lot safer to have a vaccine that may make you feel tired for a couple of days. Yes, I, I'm pretty confident there will be. There, there are five companies now, a fifth was just added. In fact, the fifth company, if I read correctly, was given something like uh, one and a half billion dollars to produce a 100 million doses for, 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 for Americans. Um, so we have five companies that are all actually in stage three, which means you're ready to test a vaccine by saying, okay, person A will get a, will get a make-believe vaccine, but they, won't, but they won't tell them, and person B will get the real vaccine, and then we'll see after a period of time, uh, so weeks, let's say, or a month or so, whether the person with the real vaccine produces, like I said, antibodies in their blood against the virus compared to the person who got nothing. And that proves that it's effective. And also, you, you evaluate, are the, uh, talk about safe, is that person going to get um, a rash or something from the vaccine? And usually the safety part is done in the first two phases, which are, which are all done. And the third phase is mostly effectiveness. And in terms of effectiveness, we, we would like to see a vaccine be 50 to 60 percent, ideally 70 percent effective. Nothing is 100 percent effective. But if it's, let's say, 60 or 70 percent effective, then it's an excellent way to fight the illness because not only do you prevent person A from getting sick, but if person A does not get sick, then person A will not spread to person B, C, D, and F. To create a vaccine is a very um, intensive process, and there's a, a disciplined scientific approach to that development ultimately because there's a lot at stake or a lot at risk, so it has to be well-defined for consistency and then also from a safety standpoint. Rather than going into all of the details of how vaccines are created and how they go through that process, we're including a link on this video that you can research for more information. And this connects directly to the CDC, which will walk you through in detail how vaccines are developed and created, and ultimately how they're approved through the FDA for distribution. Once again, we're all responding to this pandemic the best that we can. And the sooner we can get a safe and effective treatment in the hands of everybody, the better. 
So a lot of the accelerated processes are going under more stringent guidelines than even the regular process because once again there's a lot at risk and what we don't want to do is to trade speed and safety. We want to make sure that we get an effective vaccine but it's also going to be a safe vaccine. So when you start to look at some of the protocols being used, there are actually more stringent processes being in place. Because of the time factor, we may not have as much time to be able to get this quickly into the hands of individuals that can use it to go through full phase trials, which takes some time. One of the best things to do is to do your homework, to research, get into the science, and to make sure you have a really good understanding of the thought processes, the testing processes, and how ultimately it is approved. Again, the best thing to do is to go back and to check and to see how well vetted it was, you know, how valid were the studies, what were the results, and ultimately it's a hard question to answer because we don't have a vaccine yet. And so it's hard to say that with any confidence we can be sure that this is going to be a safe vaccine because we just don't have anything to truly evaluate or have criteria in which we can go back to and say this is what was done to create this vaccine. Once that criteria has been established and once we do have something that is being produced and being distributed, we can go back and do a lot of the checking behind that to see that the studies were actually valid and that we have a good comfort level or not with uh, the vaccine in and of itself. Once a vaccine is developed, it also has to be produced and it has to be distributed. And when we talk about a population our size across the world, much less in the United States or in different hotspots, there's only going to be a finite amount that's initially going to be available. The good news is that over time, manufacturing will catch up and it'll become more widely available. But this wouldn't be the first time that we've gone through this. If uh, those of you who have been around long enough remember H1N1, that was also a time where there was limited vaccine that was available. And what the approach was is that the frontline responders, so that would be your uh, police officers, your EMTs, your firefighters, your nurses, physicians, healthcare professionals, they were prioritized to receive that vaccination first because they were most likely to have the highest exposure to a potential virus. And I would expect that it would be fairly similar to what has happened in the past. But there's a really good article that was done by NPR, and we'll include a link to that article on this video so you'll have a chance to learn more about what's happened in the past and what would be the most likely approach into the future until we could get something that would be more widely available for individuals. Generally, we would prioritize those that are at the greatest risk of exposure and then, of course, those that are at the highest risk for an adverse outcome should they contract the virus. I do believe that we will not see a well-tested vaccine that will be approved and available until sometime in 2021. I could be wrong on that, but when we go back and we start thinking about the stringent guidelines that any companies should be following to make sure that the vaccine has gone through a well-vetted process and then the approval and regulatory oversight to get that to market, it all takes time to be able to put out there. And we want to make sure, most importantly, that whatever is being put out for us as a potential treatment or vaccination is going to be safe. And I think it would be very difficult for us to see that process completely gone through yet this year, much less um, early in 2021. I think that's still going to be a, a challenge for us to get there where there will be a good degree of comfort for us as a community overall to feel comfortable about the efficacy and safety of it. I think probably the, uh, the most valid source that I continue to go back to 
is the Centers for Disease Control, as they have a lot of involvement, a lot of experience with uh, mass vaccination and population health, uh, public health overall. So that's one site that I would recommend that we continually go to. There's also the National Institutes of Health, which is available, and they have a number of resources. And what we'll also do is recommend um, a site in this video. We'll put a link to some of those that I've mentioned. Personally, I don't believe it's a second wave. And the reason why I share that is because in order for there to be a second wave, we really had to have seen a quieting or a dip or a low volume in that first wave. And what we've really seen is a sustained volume. So we, since the beginning of the pandemic, we've seen those numbers continue with activity. They did drop a little bit, but not so much that I would say that it was not still being spread or not moving forward. So I think this is just a continuation of what we initially have experienced. And now that we're moving into um, cooler weather and we've got greater exposure as a population, people are getting next, in next doors, schools have come back into session in many places that we're, we're seeing that uptick. So I wouldn't see this as a second wave of the virus versus just a continuation of the initial virus. That's my personal opinion. We're really excited to be able to respond to the community's needs by trying to do everything we can to keep people safe. And so that acute respiratory clinic, or that ARC, is going to be a place where people have flu-like, COVID-19-like, or respiratory virus type of symptoms. They can go to this one location that is separate from all of our other clinic locations. It's in one of our existing buildings here in Freeport, but it's in a separate hallway and a separate level from any other area so that we can really keep potentially infectious people from cross-contaminating other people. So we're doing it to help address the public safety as well as our workforce safety. And we're excited about being able to put that in place. And we'll have more details that will be released soon. And that'll actually be featured in one of our next videos. This is a trying time for so many people. And it impacts so many of us in different ways not always physically, but also from our mental well-being is in addition to that, which is where we've talked through that quite a bit. I would ask folks to take a moment to step back and to thank all of our essential workers. It's been some time since we've acknowledged all of our essential workers that are keeping things going, making sure that we're staying on track and that life goes on. And that's probably something I would encourage our community is that life does go on. And if we take the right approaches and we're sensible in the things that we're doing, we can establish a sense of normalcy and we can continue to be productive and move forward and enjoy life while at the same time protecting people who may be at risk. I really do encourage folks to make sure that you're being patient and washing your hands, appropriately creating distance, that social distance in between parties whenever possible, as well as making sure that we're wearing our masks to make sure we're protecting other people. It's not always about us, it's about other people. And so there may be a low incidence rate of significantly um, ill children, yet at the same time those children can be carriers for their parents or grandparents or other individuals. So it's thinking about others and making sure that we stay consistent with those guidelines yet not trading off our life and putting our lives on hold, still trying to pursue and continue to do the things that we enjoy, but just doing so in a responsible manner.